Good afternoon. I'm Tara Sunshine, Executive Vice President here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and it is my great honor and privilege to welcome you to the official launch of American Negotiating Behavior by Richard Solomon and Nigel Quinney, and they are here in the front row. And I note that the second line of the book says, "Wheeler Dealers, Legal Eagles." bullies and preachers, but if you want to find out which of the two of them fall into any of those categories, you have to buy the book. Um, and it also has a forward by Madeline Albright and Condoleezza Rice. Um, I don't know if you could get any more stars into the book or into the room. Let me talk very briefly about uh, what our own study uh, came to, and let me by all means uh, give recognition to Nigel Quinney, my, my colleague here. Nigel, <laughs> Nigel gave me his proxy to make these uh, comments, but uh, when we get to the Q&A session, he really should uh, be part of the discussion. Nigel has been with us through almost all this entire series of, uh, of studies. He was an editor and put together two very important workshops, one in 2000 and one in 2007, that uh, provided the intellectual grist for, for the American study, and I'll come to why we uh, structured those workshops the way we did. If you want to understand any negotiating situation, there are really five factors you have to look at. One, the issues in play, and whether it's an economic or a political or a security issue, the the substance of the negotiation is shaped by, by the issue. Secondly, there's the personal negotiating style of the, the counterpart official across the table. Now, for most government work, the turnover in, in uh, senior officials is pretty rapid. So it isn't uh, understanding the personality of the, the official across the table is not something that's easily done unless you're dealing with the Soviet Union and you have an Andre Gromyko that's there for <laughs> how many decades, Jerry, or Joe and Lai who was for four decades in one position. Then, then it makes some sense. Thirdly, there are institutional procedures. Fourth, the geostrategic context. And fifth, the culture uh, under, under uh uh, at play that, that uh, affects the negotiating behavior. And it's these f three last issues that I've mentioned, the institutional uh, context, the geostrategic uh, position of the country, and the culture that are the things that have enough stability for you to really get off into. And I would just make one comment. There's a methodological trick to these studies, mm. and that is you really can't ask someone if I wanted someone from China to tell me how what was unique about their negotiating style, they probably couldn't do it because culture is something like your personality. It's so intimate to you that you don't have the contrast. So the trick is to get observers from another, another culture, another country, who will examine the record, witness uh, negotiating behavior, and, and say, hey, that's really distinctive about the way the Americans negotiate the way the Chinese, the Russians, whomever. Uh, I could, again, with more time, but I don't want to uh, cut into our panel, point out one silly little example, but it's interesting, and that's drinking behavior. <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese, we learned, want to get you drunk. And you may remember <laughs> Joe and Lai during the Nixon visit, he went around the room and he toasted 178 American <laughs> officials and one little thimble of, Mal, of that fiery Mao Thai liquor. If you go to Russia, they want to get drunk with you. <laughs> I'm serious, and uh, I've had that experience. And uh, If you go to France, they want to impress you with uh, the high culture of their, their wines, their viniculture. I mean, we could go on. Uh, and so you find these elements, these bits and pieces, of the diplomatic process that tell you a great deal about the cultural dynamics uh, of the, the particular country. Well, it was in that context that uh, we asked over 50 foreign officials to uh, come together in these workshops and to tell us how they saw us as negotiators. And we'll hear much more of it, but let me just briefly comment that in terms of institutional behavior, our 
structure of government, the division of powers, the competition between uh, the Congress and the White House and the different government agencies uh, has a, a major effect on our negotiating dynamic. And as Chan Heng Chi points out in her chapter, and we've heard from many others, Americans mostly negotiate among themselves. It's the interagency process that takes up 80 or 90 percent of the effort of any given of a given, uh, a given official. But then there's the power of the presidency. The president is the leader, and he really does set the tone, uh, either providing strong guidance and oversight of the negotiating process, or in some. Uh, and the Nixon administration was a good example of tight control. Or the contrast, Ronald Reagan, who was pretty much uh, hands off and let his officials do the negotiating. And that has a big effect <coughs> on the character of the interagency process. Election cycles have a major effect on negotiating. Our, our officials feel under real time constraint. that They know they only have four or maybe two years in which to achieve something. <coughs> and so they're under uh, a time pressure that uh, countries that don't have that electoral cycle don't, don't feel. And finally, one aspect of our system is what might be called lateral entry. Our Foreign Service, our, our diplomatic activity, <coughs> brings in uh, senior people, some political appointees, some brought in uh, into the Foreign Service with a, ver a variety of uh, professional experiences, lawyers, businessmen in particular, academics, and one of uh, the key points that Nigel emphasized in, in his contributions to the book is that we come across as having four distinctive facets. Uh, and that's why the subtitle of this book, Wheeler Dealers, Legal Eagles, Bullies and Preachers, reflects the, the different character of the officials who either are part of the Foreign Service or come in as political appointees. <coughs> in terms of the geostrategic context, it's clear that uh, we're seen as a superpower and uh, to the discomfort of our own people, <coughs> we're seen as uh, at least hegemons, if not bullies. And finally, there's uh, on the cultural side, sorry, can I steal somebody's unopened water? Thank you, Tom. You will get you another one. What are some of the, uh, the dramatic uh, themes that come out on the cultural side? First is professionalism. Our, our diplomats are seen as uh, serious professionals, well-prepared. They don't bluster. They don't bluff. They don't, uh, don't lie in the way that, uh, I mean, frankly, on the Soviet or the Russian side, there's a lot of bluster and, and, and bluffing upon occasion. Uh, we're, our diplomats are seen as pragmatic, as results-oriented, interested in solving problems. We have a transactional style of negotiating rather than a relationship-building style of diplomacy, which is, in the case of the Chinese and particularly the Jap 